and we are live. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure and science into classrooms around the world. And we are particularly excited because this is February and February for us in commemoration of February 11th, which is the International Day of Women in STEM, we kick out all the men all month long and bring over 45 to 50, I don't know where we're going to fall by the end of the month, sessions with incredible women from around the globe. So thank you guys so, so much for being a part of our special festivities. We are joined by eight classes, which is the most we allow. So it's like a packed house today from all across North America. So I'm going to give them a chance to say a little bit of a hello before we dive in. So we've got Miss Aldrich's grade fives in Morrison, Illinois. Hi, guys. Hi. Welcome in. Awesome. All right. We've got Miss Stevenson's grade fives in Calgary and Alberta. Let's see if we can get their mic to work. Oh, dear. Hi, guys. Hi, Calgary. Welcome in. <laughs> and we'll check your mic later. It works. We promise. We've got Miss Eagle's grade threes in San Antonio and Texas, our first Texas class. Hi, guys. Welcome in. Oh, they're not in yet. They're coming in in a second. Okay. They're excited. Or they're invisible. We don't know. We've got Miss Holloway's grade sevens in Mississauga in Ontario. Hi, guys. Oh, they're messing with stuff, too. Hey, welcome in. <laughs> We've got Miss Elliott's grade sixes in Dallas in Texas. Hi, guys. Good morning. Good morning. All right. We've got Miss Matson's grade 11 and 12s in Green River in Wyoming. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. Hey, welcome in. And last but not least, we've got Miss Fiancey's grade six through eights in Austin in Texas, our fourth Texas class today. I think that's like a record. Hi. Welcome in. All right. Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Nook in Greenland, the capital of Greenland, uh, by Dr. Carolyn Bouchard. So she is a research scientist with the Greenland, Greenland Climate Research Center there in Nook. And she's going to tell us a little bit today about her adventures in the Arctic on icebreakers and exploring one of the most unique and amazing regions of our planet. So without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Carolyn, and take it away. Yes, thank you. Thanks you very much for being here. Uh, is that working? It'll work. We can make it work together. <laughs> yes. No, there we go. Perfect. Sorry, that's not the right presentation. One of those presentations. Yeah, well, the other ones are for questions. So uh, that's almost that. But no, yeah, here. <laughs> Take your time. I'll let you know when it fills the screen. Is that okay? Almost. We need to do presenter mode so it fills the whole screen. You sure? No, it's not. No, it was earlier. It was at the beginning. Okay, I'll try again. Try again. That's okay. That's half the fun. There has to be something wrong with Zoom, otherwise it's no fun. <laughs> <laughs> what about now? That works. In icy waters, get on board with an Arctic scientist. Cool. Perfect. <laughs> yes. All right. I'll start my timer because, uh, yeah, I don't have uh, too much time and I don't have another way to look at the time. So, all right. Um, yeah. Welcome everybody. I'm so glad there's a lot of interest for my talk and Greenland maybe is what's exciting because it's kind of a mysterious place, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, so uh, thanks for the presentation. That's, uh, yeah, I work in uh, the, for the Greenland Climate Research Center, which is a department in the Greenland Institute of Natural Resources in Nuuk. I've been here for three years, and before that, I was in uh, Canada at the Université Laval, that's in Quebec City. So yes, I'm a Canadian. Uh, mother tongue is French, so I hope you don't struggle too much with my accent uh, today. So let's get started. Uh, yep. Well, oh, 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 my presentation won't start. <laughs> that's not good. It was working so well. Hey, there okay. we go. Perfect. Yes. I just have to click instead of uh, arrows. Okay. Uh, so I guess the main question is, uh, what does an Arctic research scientist typically do in his everyday life? Well, I'm going to disappoint you to start with because really what we do most of the time is to be in our office and in front of computer and 
writing, reading, computing numbers, emailing, organizing stuff. So that's the big, that's, the, that's what we do the most of our time. And uh, yeah, so that off ice, you see, but joke. And some other times we spend in the lab. And this is one of my students measuring a fish larvae. So there's a lot of that too. And some of our times we spend traveling for conferences or meeting. And that can be quite interesting and fun. That can be also a bit uh, draining uh, your energy, but yeah. And at some other time we do teaching and outreach and that's what I'm doing at that very moment. And um, yeah, but I'm pretty sure what you're most interested in you young folks is the field work. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the time I spent on icebreaker like this one, the Canadian research icebreaker Amundsen or other uh, ship up in the Arctic. Uh, here the picture we're uh, finishing assembling from the sea ice and getting ready to go on board again uh, by a very nice day, very nice weather. Uh, but I did start my career on the Russian icebreaker. This one that's called the uh, Kapitan Dranitsin. That's a very big and powerful uh, icebreaker, but it's not a research icebreaker. So there's no labs on board or everything you need to have for your science, you need to bring yourself. So that's uh, one of the challenge. Other challenges include um, languages, language, because they're Russian and the crew doesn't speak a lot of English and food sometimes. And so that's uh, where we were going when I was going. I went three times on this ship. Uh, we start from Northern Norway, travel for two weeks in different Siberian seas. That's the Barents Sea and the Kara Seas to reach our sampling area in the Laptev Sea. We would spend two weeks there sampling, 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 and then travel back and then take commercial flight all the way back home. Yes. And I also spend a lot of time on the Canadian research icebreaker that we saw earlier. So the Amundsen. This is really a research icebreaker. So there's a lot of different labs, well equipped, uh, the crew knows all the scientific activities we're doing. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, very well organized. Adds a small parenthesis for. Uh, well, US folks here, that's our $50 bill in Canada. There's the Amundsen on it. So, but maybe even Canadian don't know that because we don't have often $50 bill in our pocket. Well, at least I don't. <laughs> that's just a parenthesis. So where we go with the Canadian Research Icebreaker every summer for four to six months, maybe, well, four months, maybe, we start from Quebec City and sail up north and spend some time in different seas. It can be the Baffin Bay, Hutton Bay, Canadian Arctic Archipelagos, or the Beaufort Sea. We do a lot of different sampling, and then we come back by, well, before the winter. And yes, of course, field work, it's cool. It's a lot of fun. And uh, you get to know, and you get to see a lot of animals, and you can even find love. Um, and you can even play hockey on the sea ice. Uh, but it's a lot of work, day in and, and day out. And uh, also at night, sometimes if uh, it's late in the season or even the winter. Uh, yeah, it's pretty dark and cold. So that's some of our fishing gear, because I forgot to say uh, I study fish in the Arctic and fish larvae, that's the baby. So yeah, we needed different different sort of, of nets to study fish. You need to see some fish sometimes. Uh, so here, for example, on the top left, that's a pelagic fish. That's to fish some adults in the water column. That's what uh, pelagic means. In the top, in the middle, that's a ichthyoplankton net. Ichthyoplankton just mean uh, fish larvae. So the baby fish, 
and for that we have uh, nets that are very small mesh because the larvae are pretty small a few millimeter five millimeter ten millimeter maybe and uh, on the top uh, right that's uh, what we call a monster net and that's to collect zooplankton zooplankton a small animal drifting in the water and that's uh, food for the fish and the fish larvae so you want to know them also so uh, those are the nets and so sometimes also you want to study uh, well to samples from the sea ice then we have different kinds of net for that or you sometimes want to samples right at the bottom uh, so we have also bottom bottom troll bottom nets for for that and sometimes you also want to uh, know where in the water column your samples uh, were taken, where, where your fish larvae were exactly, for example. And those two uh, nets are examples of a multi-net. So uh, those open and close at different uh, depth. So you would know, for example, uh, that larvae I got from 10 meter depth, that one from 100 meter depth. So a lot of different instruments. And uh, here I'm gonna show a short Time lapse, if I can, I hope it works, yeah. of uh, one uh, uh, deployment of uh, the ichthyoplankton and the monster net. So every time the ship is stopped for um, deploying instrument, it, it is called a station. So a station is uh, quite long, it's involved a lot of different operations and different teams, but for us, it's the, the fish net and the plankton net. So that's just gonna be that, I'll start that now. So they use an A-frame to deploy it. That's very convenient to lower things uh, in the water. So the ichthyoplankton net, we trawl a bit. So the, the ship is moving. The monster net, the ship is not moving. It's stable. And it's not gonna come back before the end, but you get the idea. And so you spend some time on deck and after that uh, it's not finished. You have to process the samples in the ship, in the ship's lab. And then you, yeah, there's a lot of sorting and preserving and different protocol to just sometimes we have experiment with live animals or, so that's uh, a lot of it happens also in, in the lab. So I'm pretty sure by now you're like, wow, that's pretty cool, I want to do that. But uh, so imagine it's 2 a.m. in the morning, you're in your bunk in the ship and you're sleeping and then the phone ring, Caroline, fishing time. So you dress and you put all your warm clothes, your warm hat, your, your hard hat, your boots, you take your pockets, your field notebook and you're off on deck and working 10 minutes later. Maybe if you're lucky, you have time to grab a coffee and then you spend time uh, waiting for all the nests, uh, deploying your gear and stuff. And then you go back inside and you process the sample. And then that's a few more hours. And then maybe then it's time for breakfast after you all done that. So you go for breakfast and finally you can go back to bed. But just a few hours before the next phone call saying, Caroline station, it's time for fishing again. And that's for many weeks. So that's, a lot of jobs that's pretty intense it's the, the ship's running 24 hours seven days a week there's no there's no downtime so we kind of lose a bit the the sense of time one way we have to track time on the canadian icebreaker is the breakfast menu because it's always the same it's monday green cheese tuesday pancake wednesday sausage and so on so, and then also on Sundays, we have a nice uh, dinner and we dress more, a bit more fancy. So that's, that's a way to keep time. Otherwise, it's very difficult. Also, in the summer, there's no nighttime. It's always bright. So it can be a bit confusing. Yeah, and tiring. And sometimes just reaching the field work can be very difficult. Uh, that's a typical uh, route for us uh, to join the icebreaker. 
we start from Quebec City, we board a plane, that's a charter flight, all right, all comfortable and stuff. Uh, we fly to Winnipeg, then some more scientists uh, embark the plane there, and then we stop in Edmonton for fueling the plane, and then again stop in Yellowknife for fueling the plane. And then we stop the plane in Inuvik and take the last, the last bit of the journey is by helicopter four by four person, or nowadays maybe six, they change the helicopter. But so yeah, several back and forth to the ship to, uh, because there is no port, you cannot just park the boat on, uh, on dock and board people, you have to use the helicopter. But in 2011, uh, we were in the plane waiting to land in Inuvik, and then it was very foggy, so we couldn't land. So we were circling around and then try to land and then we're now at that time another time and after three attempts we couldn't attend anymore uh, because we would run out of fuel so we had to go back to Yellowknife and then in Yellowknife we spent a lot of time waiting and then we've been told sorry there's no place for you to sleep so you're gonna have to go back all the way to Edmonton and so that's why sometimes when I look at my fieldwork picture, I have a picture uh, like that. The, what is that? That's West Edmonton Mall because we've been waiting two days um, for the weather to clear and to, to finally reach uh, the ship. But imagine the people on the other situation, they were waiting to come home and then they had to stay two more days. Well, yeah. So it's frustration sometimes. And some other times your plane, your plans can change quite unexpectedly. When you were supposed to be on this big and powerful Russian icebreaker uh, Yamal, but then on the yeah, kind of last minute, the month uh, ahead, we we're, everything were planned, but some for some political reason, we couldn't get that ship anymore and so we end up with a very small ship not even an icebreaker and so we did the cruise that was okay we just end up in a bit big ice storm on the way back and uh, that's not a donut uh, it's a tire on deck and so everything was covered in thick layer of ice and that's pretty dangerous on a ship because that makes it top heavy and it, it gets at risk of capsizing any time. But we survived, we made it, and we even done some good science, even it was quite crowded in the one lab we had. But yeah, uh, another time our plan changed at the last minute was uh, on the Canadian research icebreaker. Um, yeah, we were all the scientists on board and ready to go to work, but the Coast Guard said, sorry guys, but we have some de-icing duty to do instead for now in Hudson Bay, because this year it was very unusual. All the ice was uh, pushed by the wind on the east side of Hudson Bay. And so the merchant ship, which you see here on the picture, couldn't pass. And so, yeah, the Coast Guard just has to, to the ice the, the way and so we were scientists on board the icebreaker not working so you need a lot of reading uh, yeah no no not strong internet connection i should say also so yeah but finally after two weeks we we got to start the pro the scientific program again so the field work season is generally from june to october four months all in all, but it's not always the same uh, crew and the same scientists on board. We change every um, six weeks. But some other times uh, more uh, epic missions are organized, uh, what we call overwintering. And that's when uh, the ship is up in the Arctic for 12 or, or 13 months. So, so yeah, it's spend the winter uh, there and there are different way for an icebreaker to spend time uh, in the Arctic. So in uh, the Amundsen spend, well, with the Amundsen there was two overwintering in the Beaufort Sea. The first one in 2003, 2004, uh, the ship stayed frozen in the ice 
and we send balls from from the ice, make hole in the ice and, and samples from there, or from the ship's moon pool. So a moon pool is literally a hole in the ship's hull that allow you to put your instrument in the water. That's very convenient. And uh, in 2007, 2008, the ship actually stayed mobile uh, in the ice, within ice cracks and within the Polinias. Polinias are um, placed in the Arctic and Antarctic where uh, the, it never freezes, but it's surrounded by ice, but for some, because of the currents or some special situation, it never freezes there. So uh, yeah, now there's another uh, overwintering being organized by uh, the German research icebreaker Palastam. And they actually, uh, the project is called Mosaic, and they are right in the middle of it. So you can check. I put the the link there. You can check it out. And so they, they were, well, they're going to they're going to drift with the ice basically right next to the North Pole. And this is a lot of logistic to organize such a big expeditions. Uh, for example, we uh, had to build airstrip. Uh, with the snow groomer in front of the well and in the area of the ship just so airplane uh, would land to change crew scientific personnel bring a bit of fresh vegetable sometimes and uh, yeah all the before it left Quebec City the ship has who had everything it needs for for 12 months so that's uh, a lot of logistical uh, challenge and then when you're in the ice and you study the ocean, you, you need to, to reach it. So that's uh, uh, part of the fun. But you don't always need an icebreaker. You can still work in the Arctic with small uh, ship. That's an example here, one of the small boat we have when studying in Nuuk Fjord. But Nuuk Fjord never freeze, so it's, it's still possible. Or another example here is this, uh, well, last summer, we sample uh, fish larvae and other things with Atka, that's a sailboat, so it's pretty small, but all the way, um, all the west coast of Greenland from Upernavik to Kakortok, different fjords, uh, you have an example in the picture, so they can be highs, but you can still manage, manage it. So yeah, you can still, you can do Arctic science on, on all sort of platform, all big and small. And so, yeah, already time flies. I have um, a little video. I, I, can, I, can I show? Uh, it's two yeah. minutes. You have time? Absolutely. Show the video and then we'll take a few questions after that. Perfect. I hope it's going to work. So it's um, advertising my current uh, research center, the Greenland Climate Research Center. Oh, Let's see. Fingers crossed. Well, while it's loading, thank you so much for an amazing presentation and uh, highlighting some of the difficulties of getting to Arctic field work. It's something that's always stressed when every Arctic scientist. Oh, I don't think it's coming along. Maybe. No, so it's not playing for us, Carolyn. We just still see the logo and the link. Oh, no. That's okay. What I can do, Carolyn, is I can share it with the classes when we're done so they can watch it when we're finished our presentation. Because with knowledge, we make better decisions. Does that work? It's not working. No. So I'll, I'll send it send it to me, and then I'll share it with all the classes when we're done, okay? Uh, well, the link is here. So you Perfect. can you see the link here? We got the link. I will share it with classes when we're done, too. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah <laughs> because it's available online. So uh, I didn't embed it in my presentation. So I thought it was working better. Yeah, that's okay. Again, there has yeah. to be some challenge. Otherwise, it'd be boring. But that was <laughs> okay. great. So I have one more slide. Please do, yeah. So one more talk. That's uh, a quotation from Thomas Edison that I put in my uh, thesis, PhD thesis, because I thought it was summarizing, uh, well, a lot of things. So uh, it says, genius is one person inspiration and 99% perspiration. 
So in other words, uh, scientists are not smarter than anybody else. But uh, if you are passionate and curious and you work hard, you're going to get a good scientific career. Fantastic. And that's it. Ooh, I like the frozen fish. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, Carolyn. And you highlighted the Mosaic Expedition briefly. I just want to note that we've actually been doing several sessions with Mosaic over the last few months. Um, so you can check those all out on our YouTube page as well. I think we've done five now. So you can follow the largest Arctic expedition in history, which is pretty cool. So um, let's dive in with questions. Carolyn, if you want to come back out of screen share, I'll dive in with our live classes. I also want to note we have at least two classes watching live on YouTube from Alberta and New Jersey right now. So welcome in. Uh, and if you guys want to type questions in the chat bar, please do, and I'll share as many as I can. But let's get started. Let's go to Miss Aldridge's class to kick us off. If you have any questions for Carolyn about the work that she's done, about Greenland, about icebreakers, about all of it, so Miss Aldridge's group, come on up. What made you want to become a scientist? Um, I think I'm, I, I I have a scientific mind just. I'm curious about things, nature, and uh, well, I was I was good at school, but not not crazy intelligent, I would say. But uh, yeah, I I've been, I was interested in animals and and nature, and uh, what is weird is that. I, I come from a place that there's no ocean at all, I'm, and I end up studying the ocean. So <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But I love that you highlight that. And a lot of scientists we work with highlight the fact that they weren't necessarily the best in school. They were just really curious, and they followed that passion to do something that they really loved. And so kudos to you. And sometimes you get to see pirate ships and malls and everything, which is awesome. So <laughs> extra bonus. Uh, great. Let's go to Ms. Stevenson's group. If you guys want to come up and just demute your mic. Because I know it doesn't want me to do it for you, but then we'll take a question in Calgary. There you go, perfect. So my question was, is if the one with the ice storm is really dangerous and stuff, then why when you went on the sailboat, did you go there if there was the same risk as an ice storm? Yeah. Well, in the on the sailboat, there they were in the fjord, so it's 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 very protected from. It can be very protected from the element, and also if you get into trouble, you're not so far away from a port where you can actually, yeah, find helps or just. Uh, so it's not. It's not the same situation with the sailboat. If you go out at the same place uh, in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, then you're getting yourself in, in big trouble. Yeah. But by staying close to shore, they were in, in a better situation. But I know that they had bad weather on their crossing back the Atlantic. But they're sailor, they know what they're doing. Yeah, so they, they do have to go through semi-dangerous situations to get to that area where it's sheltered, though, with that boat. They're right. not taking the boat on a bigger boat, are they? No. No, no. they, they cross the Atlantic uh, back and forth, and that was the, the worst part of the expedition. <laughs> yeah, it's actually good weather in the North Greenland part. Yeah, very cool. Good question, guys. Um, yeah. All right, Ms. Eagles class, if you guys want to come up, go for it. What's the temperature of where you go and how cold does it get? Yeah. <laughs> it can get pretty cold. Um, it... hmm. In Nook, <laughs> what, what, what's the temperature in Nook right now, Carolyn? Yeah, now it's pretty uh, a, a great day. It's minus 10. But uh, I have the, the forecast for next week, it's minus 25 and minus 20, minus 25. That's not super common for, for Nook. Nook is not a super cold place, but uh, yeah, that's what we're gonna have next week. But uh, in the, 
in the Arctic Ocean, it can be because we're there in the summer. So sometimes, well, when we're there in the summer, sometimes it's not so cold. But if we're late in the season, like October, that can be pretty cold and and snowy. It can be minus thirty, and right in the in the winter, it can be minus thirty, minus forty. When we do over winter, we make sure we have very good clothes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that even minus 10, which is about, I guess, five degrees Fahrenheit for the San Antonio class is a little bit chilly, but yeah. Uh, well, uh, for us, for me, minus 10 is the perfect temperature. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, you're in the right place. Um, Miss Holloway's class, if you guys want to come up, go for it. Um, a question that we have is, does your work uh, help prevent climate change? And if so, how? Yeah. I missed the beginning. Uh, oh, yeah, Carolyn. So the question was, is the work that you're doing helping prevent climate change? Are you seeking out answers to, to help us understand or prevent climate change? Uh, I couldn't say it helped prevent them because, uh, well, if I take the plane to go to my field work, I, I emit CO2 like everybody else. And my, yeah, my day work is not to prevent uh, climate change from happening, but it's rather to understand uh, how they affect the ecosystems. And yes, maybe uh, that's helping us to um, deal better with it or to maybe try and avoid them a little bit. Yeah. So we try our best to yeah, to understand how climate change uh, will affect and are affecting the ecosystem and what we, what can we do about it, but. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And, and something that we're increasingly seeing with scientists of all disciplines is that pretty much no matter what you're doing nowadays, whether you're involved in biodiversity or conservation or Arctic work and habitat, uh, you know, studying, you are assessing climate change. Like in some way you're seeing the impact of this and sharing that with the world, whether or not it's your direct field of research or not. But I also love how you brought up the fact that flying to these places does produce carbon dioxide in and of itself. Uh, you're the first ever to mention that. It's true, but the net gain is so positive because of people like you doing the work you're doing. So I'm, I'm, that was a great answer. Yeah. Uh, I want to pass along a quick question from YouTube class. So Ms. Fredlow's class in New Jersey wanted to ask, did you see any animals in the Arctic? Uh, did you see any polar bears, Arctic foxes, anything really jump out to you? Yeah, we, I, I've seen a lot of polar bear. And uh, always from the ship, which is a good thing because I don't want to see them from shore. Because uh, when we are on the sea ice, it's very important. Uh, there's always a, a guard with a gun and that he knows how to, to use it if in case and very checking for a polar bear uh, because there's nothing uh, more wide than a polar bear on, on the pack ice. So they're very difficult to spot. So, but I've seen, yeah, I've seen walruses and polar bears and I've never seen a fox though because I'm never on land. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, whales and, and I've never seen a narwhal eater. That's oh. missing. We'll have to do a follow up session. We'll send you to a yes. place with narwhals and, and get you back. <laughs> uh, Fantastic, Carolyn. But yeah, so polar bears, by the way, for classes and everyone's interested in polar bears, we did a session about a week ago with a polar bear biologist, and we're doing one later this week with the Toronto Zoo highlighting their polar bears. So if you're keen on bears, lots of options. <laughs> Let's go back to, oh, the San Antonio class wanted us to know it's 69 degrees Fahrenheit there, so yeah, we're 20 Celsius, lucky them. Uh, <laughs> Miss Elliott's group, if you guys want to come up, let's go to Dallas and uh, check out. <laughs> and how are they chosen? Does everyone get along? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Did you You're gonna it? have to repeat that, that was a bit yeah, of a... Yeah. No worries, so how many people make up the crew on these icebreakers um, and how are they chosen and do they get along? <laughs> <laughs> good question. Yeah, on the Canadian icebreakers, there's 40 crew member and 40 scientists. And so we have to share cabins. There's two person per, per cabins. And um, yeah, normally you, you go along pretty well. You, you're with the same person for six weeks. So you make sure you go along. And, but, uh, and how we are chosen, it's um, um, who got uh, 
found for doing research well among different years so there's always you have to make sure that there's people studying everything so there's people studying fish but there's always people studying for example the atmosphere other people the sea ice other people so there they select the projects um, to represent uh, the variety of uh, fields that uh, we want to study and then different labs and well and then it's different labs sending different person according to their time budget or student there's a lot of students uh, sometimes yeah phd student master student or yeah there's hope for us especially the grade 11 12 class who i'll go to next you guys can like be in school and not long after you can end up on a russian icebreaker in the middle of the earth yeah one thing i can add something on that i didn't yeah. uh, say but the, the there's a program called schools on board so every well yeah, i think it's every summer there's a um, school well uh, yeah 12 tw Anna. well not even always the same age but there's kids going on board and for a couple of weeks at a time and they they just they, they're involved in the research and they they help the researcher and they nice. yeah so schools on boards is a program from the re uh, on the canadian icebreaker where they bring uh, kids and uh, yeah wow. that's pretty cool yeah, another program I always like to highlight when this sort of thing gets brought up, Students on Ice in Canada uh, welcomes right. people onto Arctic and Antarctic expeditions every single year, and it's like an amazing opportunity. So if you're keen on that, lots of options, and I can share those when we're done. Yeah. Um, let's go to Ms. Matson's class. If you guys have a question, come on. <laughs> All right, Taylor, ask this question right here. <laughs> so, uh, I have a what kind of test do you test on the animals? How do you test on the animals? Yeah. So what are you testing when you're testing animals, Carolyn? When you're getting what I'm testing? Yeah, and fish larva. What are you checking for? That's a very good question. And that's where it's gets getting uh, slightly technical, but that's pretty cool because that's really what I do. Um, I, I look at uh, what, what makes them survive and what makes them not survive. So that can be temperature if it's, if it's, Actually, if it's too cold, they don't like it. <laughs> and uh, the sea ice uh, breakup, for example, the timing of the ice breakup can make them uh, survive better or not. And then when, if there's enough zooplankton of the right type in the water also, that's very important. So uh, when I get the fish larvae, um, yeah, there's different things I can watch. Well, the gut content, so imagine they're five millimeter and you look at what they've been eating. So that's uh, with uh, stereo loop. And also you, I can look at their age. That's with the otolith. That's a very small part in their head. You uh, take out and then you look at what age they were. So you can backtrack when they were born. And uh, then you look at the condition when they were born and, and was that good for them or bad for them? And you compare different year, different region, and then you figure it out, okay, what's gonna happen in the future if blah, 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 then blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm glad blah, blah, blah is an essential part of the scientific process. I'll keep in mind <laughs> next time. Uh, we've got two more classes. I uh, still ask questions. I'm gonna go to Ms. Allerby's class first. If you guys have one, come on up. Hi. <laughs> what do you do when the, um, when, the sun, when the sun sets but doesn't rise again? Yeah, so Arctic winter. Yeah, here in Nook, it doesn't happen because uh, we're below the Arctic Circle, but it gets pretty dark. The sun is, uh, in December, the sun is there at a very low angle and it's pretty, uh, it can be uh, slightly uh, depressing. But um, in the Arctic, uh, when it's dark, uh, well, we're, we have, you know, we, were, we we just uh, light candles and but the ship is well equipped. I mean, for to be working in the dark, but uh, yeah. Uh, but and the other way around, in in the summer, it's bright all the time. 
I'm sorry, I just love these questions in the Texas classes today. They're amazing about the temperature and about the darkness. Just come on up to Canada, come join us, even Quebec City. I mean, we know Toronto, we have- And then we have the long. Northern Light to cheer us up in the winter. That's true. The Northern Lights are spectacular. Everyone should get a chance to see them in their life. And you can do so in Yellowknife, by the way, only like halfway along in Carolyn's journey to the, the ice <laughs> All right, let's go to Ms. Beyonce's class to finish off in Austin. Again, thanks to the four Texas classes for coming in today. And if you have one, come on up. Oh, you're still muted. I don't know why you're unmuted, but we can't hear you right now. Let's see. Da, 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 da. You should be good. I don't know what's going on. Now can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay. So my question was, what was a really like interesting discovery you made? Ooh. Like, Carolyn, that's a yeah. good question. Um, yeah, I think one of the good discovery uh, I've done, but it's always in partnership with colleagues, you know, it's uh, not that often you work alone uh, in, in, in science nowadays. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's this uh, discovery that polar cod, that's the fish I'm studying, that's very important uh, in, the, in the Arctic. Uh, it would actually be slightly good for for it if it's a bit warmer yeah. so we thought it was well it's a, it's an arctic fish it's climate change is not good it's it's gonna decrease if it's and also people were thinking well it's associated with sea ice so if sea ice disappear polar cut is not happy but we discovered that it's maybe not the case maybe for at least the short term it's a slight increase and in the temperature is good for the species, at least, at least in the high Arctic when it's very, very at the extreme conditions there. Yeah. So yeah, people were then were, were thinking the other way around. Um, but when you discover something like that, sometimes you don't really want to say it because it's going against a bit like, ah, but climate change in the end, it's not going to be good. But transiently it might be good so it's yeah. yeah you it's it's a bit tricky to uh, share the, this news yeah but no listen i i love that that message comes out because i mean again we've done hundreds of sessions revolving around climate change and it's uniformly negative the impact on species so it's nice to hear that one species might have a little bit of a boost from a little bit warmer waters that's good to hear <laughs> there's always a balance in, in yeah. different things yeah like for example, in Greenland, there's a new species being fished, like the the, the the mackerel. They were not fishing mackerel before. The mackerel is moving north, so they're able to fish mackerel commercially and get more money. So that can be, yeah. Well, that's a good news for them. Yeah. So that's good news in a way. So, but it's it's. Uh, it's complicated, but I really. It's not, yeah, it's complicated. It's yeah, complicated. yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Carolyn, this has been fantastic. Before we wrap up, is there anywhere that you'd like, so we're going to share that video with the kids when we're done, so they can all have that video that you were going to share and, and it didn't quite work. Is there anything else we can share with kids, anywhere you tell kids to look for to learn more about the Arctic, learn more about your work, about Greenland? Uh, where can we send them? Uh, yeah, I should have made a list. Uh, <laughs> I, am, I, I don't know exactly. Uh, okay. You can send us a list after the fact. We can follow up anytime. So send us a list of some ideas and we'll share them with all the classes when we're done. Cool, okay, I'll do that. Amazing. Well, Carolyn, this has been such a thrill. Thank you so, so much for joining us. And so what we do at the end of every single session is I'm going to demute every class's microphone. And so boys and girls, if you guys get ready to join me and say a huge thank you to Dr. Bouchard for joining us today, <laughs> you are all now demuted in a second and go for it. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome guys. <laughs> so yes, yeah, to all our classes, thanks so much for coming in today. We really appreciate y'all being here. And please do continue tuning in through February, highlighting amazing women from around the world. Two more sessions today coming up in the next hour and two hours. Um, and so thanks again, Carolyn, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. All right.